time. So welcome everyone. Um, this is our first talk of 2021. And we're all very excited to have so many people here today. I see people from all over the world. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, so before we get started, um, I, my name is Christian. I am part of the Chicago Graphic Design Club. Um, we're a fairly young organization. We were created in mid 2020. And our purpose and our mission is to bring people together through conversation about both the theory and the practice of graphic design. Um, even though Chicago is in our name, as obvious as you could tell, you know, we're in the virtual world now. So, um, so we're open to everyone. Um, and given that we're, we are a young organization, we're still developing our programming, we're still developing our mission. So if anyone ever has any interest in getting involved or um, just, feel free to reach out. You could visit us on our website, which is on the screen here, or follow us on our, on our Instagram page. Um, and yeah, just let us know if you want to get involved in any way or you just want to follow us and, and be up to date with, with the stuff that we have um, going on. Um, and then uh, my colleague Angela will be, you know, briefly going over some of our upcoming events for, the, for next month. Hey everyone, I'm Angela. Good to see you all on here. I'm seeing a lot of people from Toronto and Alabama and all over the place. Thanks for writing us. Um, we have three events coming up next month. Um, we have our book club, which we will be doing a book club regularly. They're just about every month. Right now we're reading Alice Rothorn's Design as an Attitude. It's really good. If you wanna pick it up, um, we will be talking about it on the 10th and the 24th of next month. So just splitting it up. We also have office hours, so anyone can participate in office hours. Um, we're coming together to talk about whatever we're all interested in, uh, to share our portfolios, to share our work, um, anything that we want to discuss. So we do those um, monthly on the first Thursday and beginning in February. So it'll be our first one. We'd love to see you there. And then we have our next talk, which is uh, the design of the city of Chicago with Jason Kunish. Um, so that should be interesting. We're going to learn more about what it's like to design for the city. And that'll be February 23rd at six. So we'd love if you would join us. And um, now I'm going to pass it off to Melody and she's going to tell you how to participate in this conversation with Ellen, which I'm sure you'd love to. Yes. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to see you all here. Um, I am really excited for this talk. And the best part about it is that I'm sure there are going to be many, many things that us as designers don't necessarily, you know, we're not really familiar with. So if you have a question during the talk in order to just be respectful of our speaker, if you could drop your question in the chat, whether you are watching on YouTube or in Zoom, in that format of putting a Q with a colon before your question, and I just sent it to the chat to kind of show you what, what I mean. Um, we're gonna be pulling all of those throughout our talk and then we're gonna be asking them at the end just to make sure that we give everyone sort of an equal chance to, to talk. So uh, if we don't get to your question, I'm sorry, but we are looking forward to the, the rest of the talk and, and thank you so much for being here. Awesome. So with that said, uh, we're super excited to be welcoming Ellen Lupton here today. Um, me personally, I'm very excited. Uh, I, I have very fond memories of reading her, her books when I was a design student um, a few years ago. So to, ha to have her be speaking here with us today is truly an honor. So with that said, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and the floor is yours, Ellen. Yay, thank you. I am gonna grab the screen. I'm, I'm so excited to be part of your club. I hope I can continue to be an honorary member. It seems so super nerdy and fabulous. So <laughs> it was great to see so many people from Baltimore here tonight. Lots of uh, dear friends, so that, that's really cool. So I made the title of my talk, Seven Things Every Designer Needs to Know About Writing. Um, and I, I picked that because um, if you like go on Medium, you'll find literally hundreds of articles called, whoops, okay, yeah, there's my video. Um, hundreds of articles called seven things that you absolutely have to do about something. Um, so for, for shorthand, my talk is just called seven things. 
Um, and really, there's probably 50 things in this talk. <laughs> so I just kind of arbitrarily went through and um, hierarchized my text into, into seven things that you should probably do. Um, and I really like this article that's just called Seven Things and the entire text of the article is not much, but enough. And I hope I really thank Jason for Jake and the Creative Cafe for that insight. And, and I hope that I'll give you enough, but not too much, okay. So part one is gonna be three and a half things. Um, and we're gonna talk more about, about theory and some ideas, a little bit of my background, how I got into being a writer who designs and a designer who writes. And then part two is three and a half more things. And that'll be kind of the nitty gritty, like how to write a better sentence, you know? So we'll kind of dive in and, and look at a few, a few ideas about how to write better, right? Um, so I studied graphic design at the Cooper Union in the 1980s, and that's me and my dear friend and co-writer and co-designer on many things, uh, Abbott Miller. And you can see we're, we're carrying a lot of books, uh, which we typically did at that time, and are burdened to this day with many of those same books. Um, this is what design looked like in 1985. Uh, many of these tools no, no longer exist. Uh, some of them are now illegal. Uh, some of them should be in a museum somewhere. I hated these things. Um, I, these were things for uh, neat people to make neat, tidy graphic design with. Um, but despite these things, which I found very oppressive, I fell in love with graphic design anyway. And it was really because of discovering the link between graphic design and writing. Um, and that was intoxicating for me and something that I, have continued to be obsessed with and that really defines my practice. So when, when I was a student, we were told this, um, design is problem solving. And this was very provocative, very interesting to me because back in the eighties, nobody knew what design was. There was no Photoshop. There were like three books about graphic design. And uh, this was like very, very new information. Um, and this is one of the books that we read, The Graphic Artist and His Design Problems. And here's the first thing um, that writers need to do is writers need to ask questions, right? And question the truth, uh, question what people tell you. Uh, Abbott and I questioned this. We asked, what does problem solving leave out? right? Does design always solve a problem? Is that it? Is there something missing? Um, and when I say ask questions, that's for your own curiosity, right? You should always be asking questions. But also as a writer, if you pose a question, you make people curious. So maybe you're curious about the answer to this question. I know I was <laughs> and, and still am. So, so I want you to picture uh, the East Village in the early 1980s when we were in art school and you'd walk out on the street and posted on the street on lamp posts, uh, on building hoardings, there were these posters and stickers by a young artist named Jenny Holzer. Um, who is now very famous and then all the biennales and, and so forth. But, but at the time she was really just emerging and she was creating this work that used writing and typography, very blunt, ordinary typography in a way that was extremely provocative. Um, and this was presented to, to us on the street as a kind of alternative to the definition of design as problem solving, because really what problems was she solving? It was rather that she was pointing out problems in society 
she was raising problems, exposing problems, not solving them. Um, and so that was to me a very interesting uh, counter model and a use of, of typography and print and self-publishing that was very exciting. So, so that's, that's Abbott and myself um, in the East Village reading our books. Um, and these are some of the books that we read and these books are still on my shelf today, the exact same copies. And so if you're gonna be a writer, uh, you need to read. Uh, and the books that you read, I think at formative times in your life may mean a lot to you for, for many, many years. Um, and some of these books, meant a lot to me. So, so one of the books that I read in college um, was not assigned, it was <laughs> something discovered on the side, is this book by Jacques Derrida, who was a French philosopher, actually from North Africa, um, who wrote it in French. And he wrote this book called Of Grammatology that, that put forward into the world a theory called deconstruction, which many designers um, in the late 80s and, and 90s sort of applied that idea to graphic design. But the book itself is kind of about graphic design. It's about how writing always has a physicality to it. And that writing doesn't want to be physical, writing wants to be pure idea. But that body of ink on paper and space and marks and gaps is actually really essential. It's like how, how writing works and fails to work. Um, and Derrida's notion of deconstruction is really an attack on binaries, uh, something that is very much uh, still a conversation, a growing and flowering conversation today, but a conversation that he really wrote, you know, brought up uh, in this in this book, um, and uh, that inspired a lot of work for me at that time. Uh, and it inspired this book that Abbott and I published, self-published in 1996, um, and this is the first edition, which you can still find, you know, places. Um, the, the book is, has continued to be in print and in, in paperback, but the hardcover, you know, is a little bit harder to get. And if you take that jacket off, it has this really cool spine, I think, which is a ruler with letters instead of numbers. And so sort of looking at the binary of letters and numbers and are they language? Is it not language? Could you measure language? What is the space between letters? Uh, so those kind of questions were really fascinating to us. Um, and we created this book that includes this essay and, and many others, which really dealt with uh, philosophy and um, political critique, um, really interesting essays about race and advertising and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, you can check that out at some point. Um, and we really wanted to engage the design of the book as an experience that you were reading these kind of pages inside of other pages that were slipped and, and moving um, and in the wrong place. And we felt that that, that reflected this, this notion of embodiment and writing. Um, and it reflected what Jacques Derrida was doing in his own work, which was uh, publishing works of philosophy where the layout was actually part of the content. Um, and that was super inspiring to us. Um, so discovering that writing has a body was for me an intellectual awakening. You know, like they say sexual awakening. Well, it's like that, <laughs> only it's your brain. <laughs> um, and so this was like a, a turning point in my life, right? To see that writing needs graphic design, that writing can't exist without the stuff that we as these visual workers, right, bring to the page. 
Um, that was like a huge, um, a huge switch, right? That went off in my, in my brain. But not only was it an intellectual awakening, it is also incredibly practical, obvious, and utterly addictive. <laughs> so if you are a writer and you suddenly have access to the tools of publishing and typography and controlling the way your text looks on the page, you have tasted the powder and there is no going back. Um, and I can show you many writers who have had this happen to them in history and contemporary practice. I'm just gonna to talk to you about one who is uh, Balzac, the great French uh, novelist who is very well known for being addicted to coffee. He would drink dozens of cups of coffee so that he could stay up all night and writing, but he had a second addiction. And that addiction was typography. The guy was addicted to type. And how did that happen? Well, before he became the most famous novelist in France, he wrote some really terrible novels that sunk like stones. They were disasters. Um, and to try to save himself economically, he bought a printing press and started publishing, publishing books and broadsides and how-to manuals and all kinds of junk, some of it he edited and wrote, some of it was just for hire. Um, and that wasn't going really well, but he got himself dug even deeper and bought a type foundry. <laughs> it's like he wanted to get to the core of the word, the word as print, the word as published. And this is a failure too. He, he ended up selling the type foundry, which, which went on to be quite successful, um, but not for him. Um, and although he failed at these endeavors, he was hooked on the type. And he developed this writing method in which he demanded his publishers to produce many uh, printed proofs on great big pieces of paper so that he could completely rewrite and revise the text and the margin. And then these typesetters who were like losing their minds working with him had to interpret all that handwriting and fix all of this in handset metal type. It was laborious. It was incredibly expensive. They made him pay for it, <laughs> which worsened his always dire financial situation but there is no going back. He had discovered that writing has a body um, and he wasn't gonna give it up and he never did. And, and some of these artifacts are in, in collections and are, are deeply valuable today as a kind of window into how he works. And that's how I work too. And I can't stand to write something and be told that I can't make corrections and change the page and, and continually have the text be fluid. Even when the book is done, I wanna redo it. Um, and so these are some of the books that I went on to publish, um, you know, over the last 10 years, I guess. Um, sometimes people look at this and they go like, how do you write so many books, right? This is just a few of them. And I'm like, um, it's not magic. <laughs> it's just graphic design. Anyone can do it, right? These tools are there to be played with. Um, and once you play with them, you're done. There's no going back. Um, that's how it is. Uh, so these are, these are three books that I published in the last uh, three years. Um, and I would be happy to talk to you about them and tell you stories about them, but I'm not because these are done and I want to talk to you about some, some new projects instead. Um, this is a book that's coming out in 2021. Um, and it's a book that was written uh, collaboratively as are many of my projects. Um, and it's something that I highly recommend as a source of inspiration and joy for you in your work, if you want to get into writing and publishing, is work with other people um, and learn from them and uh, share the burden. Um, and those people are the only people that will really want to read the book anyway. <laughs> so, 
So collaborating is really great. Um, so this book came about uh, one night I attended an event at the Pratt Institute in New York. And these two young, wonderful young women um, had organized their senior exhibition about uh, women and design and they called it the missing pages. And they created this project because they felt that as, as young designers uh, studying their profession, they were taught very little about women in the field. Um, and I was so excited to meet them and so inspired by what they were doing that I thought, wow, we could create a feminist design book and collaborate and, and create it for, for them, create it for young people entering the field. So that was really fun. And they joined, um, they joined the project uh, and contributed incredible uh, interviews with, with other young designers and established designers talking about what it's like to work, what it's like to work in the field. Um, um, and at my wonderful friend and longtime collaborator, Jenny Tobias, joined the team as illustrator in chief and co-author. And Jenny is a designer, an artist, a writer, a historian. Um, and this is some of her contribution to the book. And the book is kind of um, half um, textbook, half manifesto, half comic book, zine, graphic novel. And this is her amazing map of intersectionality. Um, and you can imagine the process of putting something like this together, that the, the text and the concept and the images are all developed simultaneously, right? There's no manuscript, there's no before. There's no document that gets transferred, transformed into design. It's all a happening. It's all a becoming. And it's becoming constantly. <laughs> uh, Leslie Ja joined us and contributed essays about hiring for diversity. Uh, Leslie became a co-author of the book and also a big critic of the book. Uh, Leslie read the, the entire text um, and found all kinds of ways to improve it and to make it bigger and to, to broaden it. Um, and this is some of Leslie's contribution to, to the book, uh, a wonderful essay about how to come out at work. And Leslie said, this book needs more authors. And that was absolutely right. And we invited Kalina Sales to write about equity and systemic racism and teaching black designers. And this is one of Kalina's incredible contributions to the book, which talks about her experience teaching black designers at Tennessee State University uh, and the insights that she, she gained about uh, working with this community. Um, and it was really amazing to work with Kalina on like drafting and redrafting this text and seeing ways that she was changing it and changing her thinking um, as we worked through it over time. Um, it's really an incredible way to uh, collaborate with people. And we invited Josh Halstead to write about design and disability theory and to write profiles of disabled designers. And Josh's essays are incredible. He brought um, disability theory into the book. And whereas previously we had kind of checklists about using alt text and, you know, very kind of received ideas about design and disability, Josh really brought up the, the conversation here. Um, and contributed some really profound text about embodiment uh, and about the differences in bodies and how the experience of being a designer is, is an experience of, of having a body. Um, incredible work. So there's a kind of network of people, seven authors, my favorite number, enough, but not too many. Um, and I'm there uh, kind of pulling it together, uh, a co-author, but also the producer, the book designer, the showrunner, the sous chef, the midwife. Uh, this book is um, a thing, a thing that a lot of people um, came together to create, but that sort of required 
somebody stirring the pot, right? And keeping the whole thing from, from burning or, or bubbling over. So I'm really excited this book uh, comes out in uh, May, 2021. Um, the pre-orders just opened on, on Amazon and bookshop.org. So we're really excited that uh, it's becoming a reality. So how do you write a book? Uh, how does it happen? Well, for me, it's the same way that you quit drinking. It's one page at a time. <laughs> And so thinking about a book as really not a big project, but really just like 176 little projects. And every day you chip away at them um, and, and get through it. Um, you just do it bit by bit and then eventually you're done. Um, I wanted to show you the process here. So this is one of Leslie Jaw's essays and so they produced a draft in uh, Google Docs and we have some back and forth about the draft and um, get that kind of pulled together. Uh, and that's, you know, text. That's a manuscript in the traditional sense. And then that text becomes a layout um, and it's, it's very, you know, beautifully written, lots of really good information about sort of myths about diversity in the hiring process. Um, and it's, it's, it's intense, right? And so uh, Jenny and I are thinking, well, how can we uh, make this uh, content, give it a kind of second life that's more visual uh, so that someone that wants to read text has this version, but someone can also uh, experience this more like a map more like a game, uh, more something that they can uh, read visually. Um, and so that starts with, with sketches. And, and then you add text to the sketch and go back and forth <laughs> in this incredible, beautiful, fluid process until it becomes a page, a page where design and illustration and art direction and authorship are all happening uh, together and, and simultaneously. And so then that's the whole essay in the book is these two parts, right? The visual and the verbal um, with the idea of being accessible to different readers and people with different interests uh, in this topic. So it's right design, right design, right design, but really it's more like this. They're always happening together. I, I do most of my writing in InDesign. <laughs> so it's just, the, there is really no separation for me between these activities. It can drive an editor crazy, uh, but I have wonderful editors at Princeton Architectural Press and at Cooper Hewitt <laughs> who have come to uh, recognize that this way of working uh, works for me. <laughs> And it produces some interesting books and it produces them at a clip, right? It produces them um, effectively. Uh, and then, you know, when your book comes out, then you have, to, you have to be the author. You have to take care of the book. You have to uh, talk about it, share about it, teach about it. And then sometimes you have to rewrite it, you know? So sometimes books come out in uh, second editions, which is really fun. I'll, I'll show you one of those in a bit. So that brings me to part two, um, three and a half more things. Uh, and here I wanna talk about writing itself, right? So we've been talking about design and writing. And I'm not gonna talk about design now. I'm just gonna talk about writing. Um, I'm not gonna show you any more pictures. <laughs> And hopefully I can give you some tools for engaging your own writing. Uh, maybe it's not a book. Maybe it's an article on Medium. Uh, maybe it's a uh, presentation or an RFP. Uh, maybe it's a zine. Um, there's all kinds of ways that designers uh, use writing. Um, and it's just so essential to what we do, right? Because almost everything we create has some, some words in it. Unfortunately, most of us are taught very little about how to write. Um, even people who go to liberal arts programs and major in English <laughs> don't get taught that much about how to write. They get taught about how to read, 
how to do critical thinking, how to question, uh, you know, how to be a citizen, how to make uh, judgments, how to um, exist in the world as an intellectual person. But the nuts and bolts of how to make a sentence, um, how to communicate with words, um, we aren't taught that much about it. Um, and if you go to art school, it's even worse. I, I can tell you that from experience. Um, learning how to write an academic paper is probably the worst way to learn how to write because uh, this is very formal writing that uh, even your teacher doesn't want to read, right? The teacher is paid to read it, <laughs> but nobody willingly wants to read your paper. Um, they just don't, I'm sorry. Um, and creative writing is not really all that helpful either, right? This can push you too far in the other direction of kind of inwardness. Um, and away from what we as designers usually want to do with our writing, which is to communicate. Um, so uh, for me, most writing is really not creative. It's technical. Most writing is trying to uh, achieve a job, just like most design is. Most design is not art, right? It is there in the world. Um, to convey ideas to people in a pretty pain-free way. <laughs> and so if we're too creative, it can actually really get in the way of why we're writing in the first place. So, so here's a quote from Stephen King. Um, he's a very creative writer, but also a great technical writer. And he says, your job, those are my dogs, if you can hear them. Your job isn't to write words on the page but rather to transfer the ideas inside your head into the heads of your readers, okay? So the words can actually get in the way, but if you focus on what you're trying to say, what you're trying to achieve, then you can be uh, successful in doing what Stephen King is saying here. Uh, the fifth thing is that writing seeks a reader. And this may seem really obvious, <laughs> but it's, it's not. It's like if you, if when you're writing, you actually picture in your head an actual human being reading it, it really changes the way you write because suddenly you see the opacity and the wordiness and the over complexity of what you're of what you've put on the page. Um, it's really hard to get people to read your stuff. <laughs> and getting people to read your stuff is really the only way to learn, right? So you can take a writing class, you can join a writer's group, then you have to read a lot of other people's stuff. You can hire somebody uh, to read your stuff. Or you can get AI to read your stuff. <laughs> and in fact, AI is already reading your stuff. So, so when you're in Gmail and Gmail is trying to finish your sentences for you, um, that's the AI filling in the cliche, right? <laughs> Guessing how you think, right? So I was doing this one day and I'm like, well, what if I go, what the fa? And Gmail says, what the fuchsia, right? This is how much Gmail knows about me. It's scary, right? They know I, I'm a graphic designer with like a big Pantone book on my desk. <laughs> um, products like Grammarly. I love these products. I don't know why everybody doesn't use them. Even if you're writing email, right? To have an automatic AI intelligent correction to your text is really fantastic and really useful <laughs> and often right not always right but but usually right so i want to i want to do a little exercise where we get ai to help us rewrite thinking with type okay so some people have probably read this book uh, this is still one of my most uh, popular books best selling books and the reason people like this book is because it doesn't just show you how, it doesn't just give you rules, it always asks like why, okay? Well, 
I'm in the process of writing the third edition of Thinking with Type. Like what has happened in 10 years in graphic design? So the new edition, it's more feminist, it's decriminalized, it has more voices, it's more global, it's less judgy. So here's a, here's a little sample from Thinking with Type in 2010. Uh, explaining how X heights work. Very nerdy, I know. This is some nerdy stuff. <laughs> and you know, I thought this was funny at the time. And now I look at it and I'm like, it feels judgy. It doesn't feel right to me. And so sometimes you have to abandon the humor because it may be at someone's expense, right? So the new book is not gonna be as funny, okay? It's a little more informative, a little more straight, uh, a little more communicative. Um, this is the spread on uh, numerals. Okay, deeply nerdy. There will not be a quiz on this. Lining numerals and old style numerals. So I, I spent a lot of time writing this and I, I grabbed the paragraph, the sort of lead paragraph, and I wanted to check the readability. So I wanted to do some AI tests on, on this writing. Um, so readability formulas is a website you can go to and it will tell you whether your text is readable or not. Now the website design <laughs> is another problem, right? This is one of those awful websites with like PDF bait and ads that track you and follow you. And it's like a total mess, right? I am not advocating this website, but it's pretty useful because you can dump your text into a window. You see they're selling me weight loss products. Uh, they really got my number, <laughs> right? They know how old I am. They know exactly what I'm worried about and concerned about. Uh, but you can dump your text in here and it will uh, rate your text according to the difficulty of reading it and the grade level of your text. Um, and this is the six and a half thing, okay? That we should all be trying to write at the eighth grade level because that's the average reading level in the US. Um, so that's tough. And I don't think I will ever really achieve it but it is an interesting challenge and there's lots of tools out there to help you try to do it, to kind of test what you're writing. So one of them is called Hemingway Editor, which is really fun. And the Hemingway Editor basically has four rules, short sentences, short words, avoid adverbs, and avoid passive voice, right? And these are really basic things that any writing book will tell you. Um, the first two are obvious, right? Short sentences, short words. Um, passive voice, right? That's where the, the sentence that, that, that doesn't have an actor, right? So the mob was fed lies. Mitch McConnell said that on January 6, 2021. Um, it's passive, right? It, it doesn't show us who's responsible, who was doing the feeding. Um, adverbs are a little bit harder, right? Um, my mother is an amazing writer. So she taught me this when I was six years old. She's like, girls, no adverbs in the house. Okay, not doing it. But if you're not familiar with this rule, adverbs are those words with L-Y on the end, you know, like slowly, painfully, supposedly. Uh, and they're supposed to help verbs. But the thing is, if you write, have a really good verb in your sentence, it doesn't need any help. Okay, so here's some examples from Stephen King from his book on writing well. Um, yeah, and I'll just read the first one, right? Give it back, he pleaded abjectly. See, we don't need that word abjectly because you don't plead any other way, right? You don't plead confidently or angrily, right? Pleading is pitiful. Um, that's what the verb is already doing for you. So. Um, so Stephen, Stephen King tells us the road to hell is paved with adverbs. So there's my text. I dump it into Hemingway. Not good. Grade 13, and I'm trying to write at an eighth grade level. I was shocked. You know, I thought I would be way ahead of that. I have long sentences, complicated sentences. I have passive voice. Thank God, no adverbs. Otherwise, it's a mess. So I rewrote the text. 
I got down to grade seven, which is where I want to be. So I was pretty proud of proud of myself. And I actually like it. I think it's good. Um, I think it's better, right? I don't feel like I dumbed down the text or made it not smart. I, I like it. I, I really love this particular sentence. Alas, old style numerals feel out of place when sitting alone or surrounded by all caps. Has a kind of emotionality to it, you know, but it's not um, in your face either, right? Uh, so you can click on this little button, the little Grammarly button, and it will, it will give you a Grammarly account. I got 100, so I'm really pleased with that. Um, and I, I got down, right? It's much better. Um, now the ad is better. Help your paragraphs lose weight. I think that's better. And this is how it looks, looks in the book. And I, I'm kind of running short on time, so I'm going to go really quick now. Um, and it's, it's, it's better. And a lot of people are just going to look at the, the examples. And the examples bring writing and type back together. Right, so um, old style numerals don't look good with all caps, right? <laughs> they feel awkward, they feel bullied, they feel surrounded by those big letters. Um, and it, the text suffers when the typography isn't quite right. And so I would hope that writers would appreciate this insight as well. And so here, here's um, lining and old style numerals in, in a body of text. And you know, the one feels more factual, it feels more straightforward, and the other feels more literary. There's no right or wrong, there's no judgment there. It depends on what you're trying to do with your typography and with your text, right? With the writing, is it literary writing? Is it more straightforward, more factual? So it's really hard to write at the eighth grade level. Um, I will never achieve it. Um, it is something to strive for. You might ask yourself, do eighth graders really need to know about non-lining numerals? <laughs> well, actually, yes. So. When we say eighth grade level, we're not saying eighth graders. We're saying people that read at an eighth grade level. So imagine uh, you're teaching a type class and you have students from another country, students who are learning English, right? They need to know about these numerals too, right? We all need the pleasure of, of big and little numerals. Um, so I'm going to end with this, which is, I want to see if anybody can guess what novel this is from. So take a moment to read the text. When the buckets fell, she was at first only aware of a loud metallic clang cutting through the music. And then she was deluged, passive voice, in warmth and wetness. Anybody got a guess? You can put it in the chat. I'll look at the chat later. This text is considered grade three level by Hemingway, which is kind of shocking to me, right? I wouldn't necessarily want a third grader uh, to read this book. This book is Carrie by Stephen King. I read it in eighth grade and my mother doesn't know this, but I stayed home. I pretended I was sick so that I could read this entire book cover to cover in eighth grade. Um, if I ask Grammarly to judge the emotionality of this text, Grammarly says, looks good and sounds joyful. <laughs> joyful, oh my God, the, the D words, doom, deadness, and discordant. So the tools aren't always right, um, but they're really helpful. And, and if you wanna write, and I hope you will, it's really fun and it's powerful and it's part of graphic design. Um, just enjoy it and, and do your best and just try to remember being in eighth grade. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was amazing. And I'm sure everyone else can, can agree with me as well. 
Um, so we we got a few questions in. Good. To, uh, a lot of people guess Carrie. Yes, it's such a great postmodern book. <laughs> Yeah, I love that book too. My goodness, I loved it. Um, Lots of people read it in eighth grade. Yep. <laughs> absolutely perfect. So I guess we could just run into some questions. And as we are talking through this Q&A, anyone, if you have any more questions um, that are popping up as we're talking, feel free to drop them in the chat. And we, we're, still, we're still watching, we're still pulling them in. So we have no shortage, which is great. So Ellen, if you're not Hi. Ellen, and how do you convince a publisher that design matters? Um, well, here, well, goodness, you know, designers buy a lot of books. I feel like I'm really lucky to be writing about this field because there's a, a community that, that really does read and that really does like to read about what we do. Um, so, you know, when you're, if you want to write a book, uh, one of the things you have to do is, is demonstrate that there's a market for it, uh, that there are readers. <laughs> and graphic design books, if you go on Amazon, there's like tons of books and some of them are quite uh, popular. So it really is a very rich, a rich area to write about with lots of potential. We have plenty of nerds here, so <laughs> I'm sure we're all like, oh yeah, duh. But you know, sometimes that 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 extra consideration can definitely go go a long way. So I have another question here specifically for educators or people who are interested in education. Do you have any advice for educators to encourage design writing in students as opposed to just reading about design? Um, well, assigning it. You know, I, I think uh, encouraging students to write, uh, you know, I, I just finished watching the Fran Lebowitz documentary and she makes some really interesting points that writers hate writing. Like people have a fear of writing, even the most uh, gifted writers. So imagine, and I just have the empathy, imagine a student who like, you know, came to art school maybe partly to avoid writing <laughs> or to only do, you know, creative, like introspective writing and not communic communicative writing. Um, it's scary, right? So by, um, by inviting people to do it, it takes some of the fear away, right? If everybody's writing. If you're writing things that are short, like I feel that writing a single paragraph and subjecting it to the rigor that I subjected that paragraph about numbers to <laughs> is actually really the best way to learn to write because writing is one sentence at a time. And I think it's less intimidating if you do something small and make it beautiful. For example, a one paragraph book review is an incredible little piece of critical writing for a student to do. It's actually very publishable too. Yeah, awesome. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on how writing seeks a reader? Yeah, so when I wrote the, the first edition of Thinking with Type, which is now back in 2004, I actually made a sign that I put on the wall over my desk, which was, um, who's reading this and why do they care? And I, I made myself continually ask that question that I wasn't writing this book in order to prove that I was smart or that I know more about type than somebody else, which is like, oh my God, the typography field, it's very competitive. People love correcting each other and one upping each other and pointing out your misspellings. <laughs> you know, it's very judgy. Um, and that I wasn't writing the book to prove my authority. I was writing the book because I wanted people to enjoy creating typography and to feel invited to create it. And so when you have in your mind another human being who's going to read what you've created, <laughs> it, it's almost as if they're sitting there with you. It's like an imaginary audience 
you've, you've invited them in even before they exist. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. That kind of reminds me of like, when you're so excited about something and you finally have someone who asked you, you know, of like, what do you think about this topic? And you can just go on forever, right? Kind of imagining that I feel like could be could be helpful to kind of reframe your thoughts around like being pressured to put words on paper as opposed mm -hmm. to like, how would I just say this to someone, you know? How would you just say it, right? If you wanted them to, to know it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh goodness. So how do you think a process like yours of uh, being a designer and, and writer? So a writer writing in InDesign, um, do you think that's gonna be like more embraced as a method in the future? Um, because especially to the question asker, it feels like design is becoming much more ubiquitous in these times. Mm -hmm. I do, and there, there's a long history of uh, writers who uh, design and writers who actually were designers before they became writers. Um, in other words, that typography and design introduced them to writing. It was their gateway in. So Benjamin Franklin is one, uh, Walt Whitman is one, um, uh, William Wells Brown, who was an incredible abolitionist writer, found his way into writing through learning to print from being a typographer. He learned to read by, by setting type. Um, so it, it's, it's somewhat, it's something that exists in history, but now we have these tools that are just uh, so accessible that I think it will become more and more common. So Jonathan Saffron Foyer and, um, uh, Dave Eggers, right? These are famous, popular literary writers who, who use graphic design in their work. Um, but anybody can. And we, you know, graphic designers, like we already have that tool. And so if you can look at that tool as your entry into writing, like Benjamin Franklin or Walt Whitman, <laughs> Right, like you have the key into that world. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's, it's great that there's so many more people who are going to be not only starting to get interested in, you know, what we're interested in, but being able to um, explore that even further, right? So I have sort of a two-parter for, for the next question. Um, one being from the perspective of new designers or graphic design students, and then also one for writers who are working with graphic designers. So um, I guess we can go first with, with what advice would you have for, for graphic design students who are just discovering or starting out in design writing? Um, publish stuff, make zines. Um, you know, I think zines are a really cool genre because it's this, publication you can make yourself and there's a whole community of people that uh, that trade them and are also interested in them. Um, so many people are interested in graphic novels and the comic book genre. So there's a, there's a lot of genres that are just very connected, very adjacent to graphic design and that uh, need us more than say a novel needs graphic design. You know, these, these media are very um, typographically and visually engaged already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Cause it's, it's like, you can't li really live with one without the other, right? And <laughs> yeah, they, they're just, they're completely connected. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So thinking about the writers of, you know, the novels or the zines or the graphic artists, what advice would you give to them when they are working with designers, if maybe they don't, maybe they don't have experience or, you know, how do you think they could work better? And do you have any best practices that you kind of have, have noticed over time? Well, I did a, a book I did recently called The Senses that I did at Cooper Hewitt. I actually worked with a graphic des designer, a guy named David Genko, who created the format of the book. Because uh, I, I just, I was doing a lot as curator and I wanted a more sophisticated feeling than what, you know, my design is kind of like, you know, 
just functional design. I wanted something kind of more beautiful. I wanted to collaborate with this wonderful designer. So he created the shell, you know, the fonts and the cover and the, the sort of beauty of the book. But then I did like all the layouts. <laughs> and then he would pass through and fix it and tweak it and make it more great. And that was really fun. And I think there's a lot of possibility for writers who are interested in graphic design to work with a designer to kind of give them the tools, but let the writer actually get in there and play, you know, shorten the paragraph so it doesn't run onto another spread, you know, all the little things that if you're just there and can fix it yourself, it's just so great. Yeah, I definitely understand that working as a magazine designer myself, it's like the promotion pull between <laughs> the editor and then my job is like who's- It's a wall, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so, like a fighting, a point of friction. Sometimes, but it's also really beautiful when like things just work out or like when there's no widows and no orphans. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's like, oh my God, this, it actually falls into place perfectly. Right, as I'm sure you, you've probably experienced. But that never happens. And so then you have to edit. <laughs> yeah. And when it's your text, you don't have to ask permission to fix it. You know, mm -hmm. I'll rewrite anything to make the rag better. <laughs> yeah, sure. So we have one more minute. And so I guess- Okay, a, great. A quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. so being an essayist, do you have any favorite essayists that you suggest that other people would read? Um, I love Joan Didion. Um, I love Roxane Gay. I love, um, I don't read all that many essays. I really like reading um, like news or literature, <laughs> but um, an incredible book about graphic design that I just reread um, is Robin Kinross. It's a book called Unjustified Type. And it's an incredible, um, incredible, super nerdy, but beautifully written book uh, with, with essays. I guess you would say he's an essayist. Um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't ask me what prose is. <laughs> that scared me like, oh my God, what, what is prose? Yeah. All right. So, so, so we're just about time and I wanna be mindful of everyone's time, but um, I just want to thank you, Ellen, so much for all the knowledge that you just laid upon us. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. It was a super great talk. Uh, we did record it, so I know for myself in the future, I'll be revisiting this, so it'll be on our YouTube channel. If anyone wants to, you know, share it amongst friends, uh, feel free to do so, but with that said, thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, Thank you. and thanks to all my friends who came out to see this. I see Bill Jr. out there. I can't believe it. How are you doing, Bill? <laughs> Thank you. It was really fun to be in your club. I appreciate it. All right, well, come back we and see you again soon. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. <laughs> see everyone. Bye.